How can we solve that thing? It's just got one unknown. It's, it's the width. Remember, this is, while it looks like just one equation, it's a, it's a, it's a system of equations for I grid blocks. So we're solving for the width in each I grid block. In this case, I, I drew five, but, but we need to write our code such that it can be arbitrary, five or 500 or 20,000, OK? Now, if you, two of you at least took reservoir simulation. Two of you took reservoir simulation. If you took reservoir simulation, we wrote down equations on grid blocks like this, and they were in terms of pressure. But there was no nonlinearity. There was no pressure Q. It was just pressure. And so that, if that stupid nonlinearity wasn't there, we could just pull, right? Then it would just be a coefficient matrix. You could pull the Ws outside, and then you'd have a big coefficient matrix, right? So you, you'd, you'd have some system of equations that, you know, if I, could just, if I could just pull the Ws outside, I'd have some big coefficient matrix. I'll call it K times W, right? So W is a vector, K is a matrix. Right? And then that's equal to the, the right-hand side. Oh, by the way, there's one last thing I need to add. When we did the mass balance, I didn't, I didn't have any external source. Well, we're going to inject fluid here. So I should have included an external source. So uh, I'm going to include it now, right? So this is going to be, this is going to be plus qi equals zero. All right, so this is just the q is just the, the, the source, right? the injected fluid in the ith grid block. And the only one we're going to inject into is the first one. But in general, we'll, we'll leave it as the ith. Right? But the only one we'll ever inject into is the right. It's as simple as that. And that should have been included in the mass balance PDE, but I just uh, I forgot to put it in there. Okay, so yeah, so then you know this is going to be a matrix K times a vector W is equal to you know matrix Q, which in this case you know Q is only going to have one entry in the in the first grid block, and then we know the solution to this equation. If that's a matrix, and I mean, this is a linear algebra problem, then the solution to this would be W equals K inverse times Q. Right? So that would be the width. That would be if we had a linear system of equations. We don't. So how do we solve this guy? Well, what we have, you know, you can think of this matrix K as a function of, so it's like K is a function of W. K is a function of W. Right. Times W. Now, now we have nonlinearity. You can see it. It's clear. Right? If, if I have something that's a function of W and I multiply by W, I have at least W squared, right? <coughs> so one thing you might try, uh, when you took numerical methods, did you, when you solved, uh, did, you, did you look at iterative solutions to linear systems of equations, right? So and, and the, the name for that is like Gauss-Seidel, right? Well, it's one name. Right? There's other types. That's an iterative scheme where basically what you do, you know, if this is a matrix and this is a vector, you guess what the vector is, right? And then you compute, you know, you, take, you use your guess to compute the product, and then you subtract that side, and then whatever the difference is is sort of the out, out of balance part, and you use that to update your new guess, right? And you try it again. So you, you take your new guess and you stick it in there. And you do it again, and you can do it again, and you keep doing that over and over and over again, and then eventually until you reduce to some tolerance, right? So you, you know, some solution tolerance. 
So that's an iterative scheme. So that's something we could try here. We could try an iterative scheme here. So we could guess a W, evaluate this matrix with that guess, and just try to keep iterating. So <clears throat> let's let's see what happens if we try to do something like that. So this is an example. I I, I have some notes on um, I have some notes on uh, numerical methods. This is an example I pulled from that. So here we have a, you know, just, just to be clear, it's not the same equation, but it's, it's a, this is a nonlinear system of equations. That's what we're doing here. We're solving a nonlinear system of equations. Okay, this is also a nonlinear system of equations. The equation of the circle and the equation of that line, and I want to find the solution of that. The solution is what? The roots, right? I mean, it's where they, where the lines cross each other. So, if we just tried that, what well, basically what I described. So I, I, I guess uh, let me show you the in case you don't realize. I mean, these are the equations. So this is this is the equation of a circle with radius two. Right? And I just rearranged it where I have x equals something, y equals something. Okay. And that, so this y, that's the equation of that line. So this is our system of equations we're solving. And we're just going to do what we said. We're going to guess an x and a y, plug it in, and iterate. So what I have is a little animation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose an initial guess of y equals 0 0.8. Right there, where my little dot is. You see the dot? So I'm going to choose that, and then I'm just going to iterate. So I'm going to, I'm going to plug that in, compute what x should be, <coughs> use that x to compute a new y, and go that way. So I played a little animation, the animation representing the iterations. If, and in this case, it just took one iteration. Like it just jumped. It started here, boom, it found the root in one iteration. And it, it's hard to see, but it, it is like bouncing around it because it's, gonna, it's reducing your tolerance. But it got really close on the very first iteration. Okay, But that's only one root. What about the other one? So let's see if I, if I try the same thing. If I choose this guy, here and see if we can find that root. Doing the same exact thing. This sort of Gauss Seidel iteration. Close? Nope. Whoa, what happened? So I started here. My first jump was close, then I went here, and then it jumped off the screen. So it diverged. And so if you look at if you you know you actually look at the numbers then you can see that things go haywire. You can get imaginary numbers and other things. So this, this rep the slider bar represents the iterations that we take. Okay. Now, if I choose a little bit different initial guess, I can converge. Right? So here, So here's the same thing. I just chose a little bit different initial guess, and I was able to converge. And so the point of this is to say that if you if you try to do this gauss seidel iteration in a nonlinear problem, you're going to have an extreme sensitivity to the initial conditions, and it might work. You might get lucky, especially if you if you know what the, if you happen to know what the roots are, what the solution is, and you can have a really good guess initially. Then you then you have it might get there. But it's not a very robust technique. Okay. And so 
So what's something a little more robust that we could do? So what we're going to do, we're going to define a residual vector, okay? And that's going to be k of w times w <coughs> minus q, right? So if if w is exactly the solution, then k w times w minus q is exactly equal to zero, the zero vector. Okay. But in the event in the event that, you know, if, if W were close but not a, the exact solution, then there would be some residual, right? There, there would be hopefully, you know, if W is close to the right answer but not exactly, then R is close to zero but not exactly. And what we want to do is we want to come up with a scheme that drives R to zero. Get, pushes it towards the zero vector. Okay. So that's what you know, the residual vector is literally, you know, it's called the residual vector because it's, you know, it's sort of the difference from zero, right? This kw times w minus q should be zero if we have the exact answer. Okay. So if we do a Taylor expansion of R, So there's lots of uh, indices here. So remember, uh, previously we had i, the ith indice I'm using to represent the spatial discretization, so the grid block. Right? And then I also had a capital N that represents the time. Remember, so capital N was a time step, a step in time. We were solving a fluid diffusion problem, so we're going to inject fluid at some rate. We're going to see how it propagates in time. Now these little ends, they're just going to represent iterations of a newton rapsi scheme, okay? So they don't represent anything other than an iteration. <clears throat> and so if the residual vector is zero, or the zero vector, then we can approximate that that where KT is called the tangent stiffness matrix. This is really just a tangent stiffness. This is just really a sort of a leftover from the fact that all of these methods were born in finite element analysis, which was born 
as sort of a matrix of methods of structural mechanics. So this, I mean, if you had a nonlinear mechanical problem, this would literally represent the stiffness of, you know, say you had a beam and you had a really large deflection, this would represent this, this sort of not the stiffness of that beam. Uh, we call it the tangent stiffness just because of that, but it has, you know, it's, other than that, it really, you can also call it Jacobian or something like that, right? Because what it is, is remember, so KT, is so it's a, this is a matrix right remember r is a vector okay and w is a vector so if I'm taking the partial der derivative of a, of a vector with respect to a vector, I get a matrix. Right? So basically what I have to do there is I take, you know, I hold one of them fixed, right? So I take the first entry of R and I measure its rate of change with respect to every entry of W. That just becomes one column of the matrix, right? Then I take the second entry of R and look at its rate of change with respect to every change in W and then it becomes the second column of the matrix. So this is a matrix. Okay. So then the change in W is equal to minus KT minus 1 of N uh, which if you wanted to write it out So then W at N plus 1 is equal to W at N plus delta W. And then you would, so basically you would continue to do this, right? So you would, you'd, you'd have a, you'd choose an initial guess for N, okay? Then you would compute the update. So you'd evaluate the tangent stiffness at n with w at n, compute the update, now you have n plus 1, right? And then that ends that iteration and you do it again, right? So the n plus 1 would become the n, and you just keep doing it until you re reach some tolerance, right? So there's lots of different tolerances you can use, but maybe, you know, maybe you say you wait till the, the change, you know, n plus 1 minus n normalized by n plus 1 is, you know, less than some tolerance, like maybe, you know, e to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 6 or something. Then you stop the iteration, select that w as your solution. So, if we do that, if we do that, um, then we have a robust scheme. So this is the same. This is the same problem with the same initial condition that shot off. You know, when I tried to do a gauss seidel it just shot off the screen because it, decon you know, it, it, it diverged. If I run it in a Newton-Rapson, we see what happens, right? So here, initial guess, and I hone in on the root. And that's with the same initial guess, right? So remember, the gauss seidel was very sensitive. In this case, I used the same initial guess, and I got there. Right. And, and it is robust. I can, I can use other initial guesses and I'll always find the roots. And so what this is is just a, uh, this is just a higher dimensional form of Newton's method. You guys remember Newton's method? Okay. 
So I just want to remind you what Newton's method is. So here's a one-dimensional form of Newton's method. So here's a, here's a curve, and we want to find its root. Right? So just visually, what, what we're doing, right? we take an initial guess. We'll call it x0. And we compute the tangent at that point. Hence the word tangent stiffness in the higher dimension. Right? We compute the tangent. So that's the tangent. Right? So we come over here. We find you know the tangent is a straight line, so we know its root. Right? We can find its root. And then we evaluate the function at that point, and that becomes our new guess. So then we have our new guess, and then we compute the tangent there, and then we have its root, evaluate the function, that's our new guess, and then we compute its tangent, and the new guess, its tangent, and you see how we hone in on the root? So that's what's happened. So just to play it, guess, compute the tangent, new guess, compute the tangent, new guess. Y'all like my animation? Would that have helped when you if you saw it? When did you really know that's what we were doing when you uh, when you took numerical methods? Okay, so this is really easy to visualize in one dimension because you're you're literally just computing a tangent, right? So in higher dimensions, which is when we have a, I mean, that's what I'm saying, when we have a system of nonlinear equations, we have more dimensions than one. And so it's harder to visualize. I mean, you could, you could sort of go up to three dimensions, right? Because in three dimensions, you think of your, your solution space would be some sort of plane or something in three, in three dimensions, right? You could think of it like a, you know, th we live in a three-dimensional world, so you can think of the solution space maybe like some mountains, right? And your solution is in the valley. Right? And so what you're, what you're trying to do is to shoot into the valley. And you, you do that, you know, if you're standing on a mountain, you, you know, you, and you want to get to the valley, you, you sort of orient yourself and you find the steepest, right? If you want to get there fastest, right, you, you find the steepest way down, right? And then you walk a little ways. And then once you get somewhere, maybe, maybe the slope changes or something, and then you say, oh, if I go that way, I, I can. It's a little steeper, right? So then I go, you know, I take a few steps that way. All the while, you're trying to get into the valley as fast as possible. So that's sort of that would be like a three-dimensional example, right? But when you have, you know, you could have a system of equations that has a billion entries, right? So it's a little hard to visualize what a billion-dimensional surface looks like. But we're doing the same thing. We're trying to find the steepest path into some local minimum. Okay. So that's how we're going to solve this guy. Go back to the equation. So that that's how we're going to solve it, right? Instead of being equal to zero, I mean, we're, you know, we're going to say that this equation, the, the left-hand side there, is equal to some residual. We're going to take a guess at w, okay, and use that guess at w to compute this tangent stiffness matrix, right? This this matrix, and then use that to compute an update to our guess, and we're going to keep doing that, right? And then eventually, we'll get to a point where we've our updates are small, and we've reached some convergence criteria, and we'll stop. We'll accept that as our solution at W. Okay. Now the thing is, we have to do this at every time, right? So, so the big ends represent time. We're, we're going to be marching forward in time as we inject fluid at a constant rate, right? And so we have to do this. At, you know, basically we'll we'll do this at at um, time t equals zero, and then we'll take a step in time delta t. We'll do this local Newton iteration again. That'll be our solution at, at that time. 
Then we'll take a step in time. Newton iteration again. Accept it. And so I didn't put the end superscripts on any of the other things because at, at this, up to this point, I hadn't decided how I wanted to discretize it in time. And depending on, especially if you've taken reservoir simulation, you know that you know, depending on if I put the superscripts in or n plus one up there, then I have either an explicit or an implicit scheme in time. Right? And if you remember, or if you took that class, you know that explicit schemes have a stability associated with the time step, and, and implicit schemes are more stable. Uh, for linear problems, they're unconditionally stable, meaning you can take whatever time step you want. Uh, so what we're going to do here is the hardest way. We're going to do it fully implicit. So on every one of those Ws, it's an n plus 1. So we're going to, you know, so there's a n plus 1. Right. So we're going to solve this equation for W i n plus 1, the width at the end of the next time step. Right? Now, the, So then the W i n just comes from the previous time step. That's the previous converged iterate. Right? Or in the case of the, the n equals 0 time step, the, the, that's, that's the, some initial width, right? which could be 0. OK. So. We're going to start writing code now. Um, the first sort of hardest thing to do is we have to compute that A. Remember uh, from last class, A was this influence matrix, and it was sort of uh, a combination. You know, it, it, it comes from the elasticity solution of uh, of the you know an elliptical fracture, and I gave you the equation for what it is, but in order to evaluate it, you need to know, know the corners of the good points and the centers. Okay, And it's a matrix, right? And so what I want to do to start is 